When I was growing up, one of my heroes was Mr. Fred Rogers. Mr. Rogers was a pastor and a TV personality well before the golden era of televangelism. And he, more than focusing on the eternal life, focused on the internal life, the inherent worth and value that is inside of each and every person. Once upon a time, Mr. Rogers went to New York City to record a segment in Penn Station on Little and Big. And this was after a school shooting in Paducah, Kentucky. It was the late 1990s. And the perpetrator of that crime had left a note in advance, actually, that warned something really big is going to happen. Mr. Rogers wanted to respond with this segment. And he said, wouldn't the world be a different place if rather than aspiring for greatness, rather than doing big things, we aspire to do little things, knowing all the while that it's the little things that add up to something big. Before the taping began, there was a crowd of people who'd come to watch, and Mr. Rogers saw this one young boy with a big sword that had lights and sound effects. And Mr. Rogers knelt down to speak to that child and said, my, that's a big sword you have. And he didn't say a word. He'd looked the other way, and his mom was like, come on, son, that's Mr. Rogers. She grew up on Mr. Rogers. He was growing up on He-Man, Skeletor, Masters of the Universe. And the mother apologized, acknowledging the production schedule, the rush that Mr. Rogers must have been in, but Mr. Rogers was not rushed. He continued there on knee until that boy's eyes locked on his and that kid exclaimed, it's not a sword, it's a death ray. <laughs> and mom was proud that he'd broken his silence and said, do you want to give Mr. Rogers a hug? And he shook his head, no, something fierce. And Mr. Rogers just leaned in besides the shaking head and underneath his arm raised and he whispered something in that child's ear. And a countenance came over this boy that was that of a child. He made eye contact with Mr. Rogers and hugged him ever so tightly. Of that experience, Mr. Rogers said, whenever you see someone, a little boy, carrying something like that, he wants to show people that he's strong on the outside. I wanted him to know He's strong on the inside too. So that's what I whispered into his ear. Don't you know you're strong on the inside also? I thought maybe that's something he needed to hear that day. Maybe that's something some one of us needs to hear today. That you are strong on the inside if God's spirit lives inside of you. This strength that we're talking about is nothing of our own doing or our own choosing. It's not on our strength, but it's based on everything that God has done. Strong on the inside, if God's spirit lives inside of us, and if it does, since it does, it affects everything on the outside, and we call that fruit. The scripture that Sarah read is from the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. And the overarching theme of that book, Paul's letter to the Galatians, is life in Christ. Life. Salvation is a gift that is free for all people. It's free to all, and it is free in all. And that gift of salvation brings freedom. The fruit that our lives produce is the proof that the Spirit is in us, that we have that gift, the salvation inside of us. And this morning, we're talking about fruit. And there are two points that we want to make. What do we mean by fruit? And how do we produce this fruit? So the first point, what do we mean by fruit? This fruit is that which is inside of us, that spills out of us very naturally, inherent in who we are. Fruit is the natural product 
of that which is connected to. In that sense, the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ can be compared to a fruit tree. Just like a tree is known by its fruit, so too is the disciple of Jesus known by his or her fruit. An oak tree doesn't produce apples, it produces acorns. An apple tree produces apples because of its DNA, its identity as an apple tree and the way it's made up. Its natural result is an apple plucked off of an apple tree. When we put our trust in Christ, we are grafted into him. He is the tree and we are the branches and given, we are given the sap of God's Holy Spirit that runs through us, inside of us. It rewires us, gives us the DNA that is Christ and gives us a new identity. Out of all of that comes the fruit that we produce. The life, attitude, behaviors of followers of Jesus, it reflects that fruit, the presence of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. And as we grow in Christ, we begin to look more and more and more like him. And the fruit is all of those things that emanate from who we are in Christ. And so it's very natural. We cannot beg, barter, or buy this fruit. It is not transactional. It is relational. A natural, organic consequence of our relationship with God. We don't just will ourselves to be kind. Goodness isn't the result of making better choices. Self-control is not the effect of just try harder. What do we mean by fruit? We mean the character of Jesus that is produced in our lives over the course of time by God's Holy Spirit within us. The character of Jesus produced in our lives over the course of time by God's Holy Spirit within us. So if that's what we mean by fruit, how then do we produce this fruit? If it's not just try harder, be nicer, do better, how do we do this? Jesus said in John 15, 5, if we remain in him and he in us, we will produce much fruit. He does not coerce us, does not force himself on us. He invites us into a relationship and the fruit that is produced is a function of that friendship with Christ, that intimacy with Jesus. So what can we do? We can position ourselves next to Christ, for friendship with Christ, intimacy with Jesus. Leanne had an Uncle Bob who farmed wheat in north central Kansas. This farm had been in his family for over 100 years. He started working it when he was 15 years old, and he had over 61 wheat harvests on his own every fall. He would till the soil. He would plant the seed. It would begin to sprout. And then as winter came, it would lie dormant. When springtime approached, it would begin to grow and produce wheat to be harvested in early summer. And then he tilled that soil all over again and planted seed like clockwork. Kansas produces enough wheat every year to feed this world bread for two weeks out of a year. Just the state of Kansas alone. And Uncle Bob was a part of that for over 61 years. Did he make the wheat grow? No, but he tilled the soil, planted the seed. He watered and fertilized. He knew the earth was familiar with growth patterns and gave himself to the rhythms that God set in motion. In that sense, Uncle Bob positioned himself to be fruitful. That's how he made his living. Every farmer knows you plant the seeds, you water, fertilize, but only God makes this seed grow. Within every seed, within every seed, 
is the potential for it to become what God has created it to be, whether an oak tree or a bushel of wheat. And the same goes for the disciple of Jesus Christ. Something mysterious happens in order to make us grow into what Christ would have us to be. We have everything in us to be fruitful. And we're talking God's Holy Spirit, which is synonymous with salvation. We are utterly dependent on something mysterious, namely God, for spiritual fruit to be produced. So how do we produce fruit in our lives? By positioning ourselves next to God, the one who came near. We position ourselves through friendship with Christ, holy habits and rhythms that we talk about often, ways in which we open ourselves up to the continual outpouring of Christ's presence within us, while at the same time cultivating fruit. It's pushing those things that are not of Christ out of our lives. It's not about our stopping. It's not about our ability or our knowledge. It's not consumption of content. It's God's presence, his nearness, which is for our own good. So how do you position yourselves? Some of the ways I position myself, reading scripture, which shapes my understanding of who God is and how he is and forms the way that I live my life, or by listening to God's voice in moments of quiet solitude, or by serving others, which stirs my affections for Christ. But I believe this positioning looks different for everybody. What I do may not work for you. It may not stir your affections for Christ or produce fruit in the same way, but I also think we have elevated the individual positioning over and against the corporate because I am a part of something bigger than myself. And so are you. We are together the body of Christ in the world today. We are the presence of Christ in this world today. So how do we position ourselves? Well, let me give you some other suggestions, especially if this is a new idea. And the first thing I would suggest is that we commit ourselves to corporate worship every week because, again, I am, you are, we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. Worship is all of life, and what we do in the scattering is worship unto God but it is shaped and formed by this corporate gathering. And if we are Christ's presence in the world, how much more so and how much greater the experience when we come together week in and week out, recognizing our dependence on God and strength for the journey, dependence on each other as well. Commit to corporate worship every week. Second, interact with the scriptures when we are together. Don't you know, most of the songs we sing are lifted right out of scripture. The one who sings prays twice, and we're singing the very words of God. We read the scripture before the sermon and at other places, the call to worship. And there is always an opportunity for that scripture to get into us. And that's why We are a people of one book. Why I want you to bring your Bibles, use the Bible, let this word get in us, underline, take notes, write it down, write points down. Let the word of God shape who we are, much the same way it does individually in the scattering, how much more so in the gathering. Commit to corporate worship, interact with scripture, and then engage with the prayer in all of the ways that we pray invocation, in the lingering, prayer after the sermon with our prayer support team, but definitely during this prayer that's carved out every time we gather, space and opportunity for silence and for listening, time to engage with the living God. Leanne once said that the reason she comes to the altar during prayer time is not because she's super spiritual, but it's because Sometimes she's easily distracted. And that act of moving helps her to focus. And the posture of kneeling helps to reflect a dependence upon God. Engage with God through prayer in the context of this community. 
commit to the corporate gathering, interact with scripture, engage in prayer. These are simple things we can do to position ourselves for fruitfulness. And they're carved out of our calendar, week in and week out. Not something we decide to do on Sunday morning, Saturday night, but it's who we are, the gathered body who scatters and gathers a living, dynamic, breathing organism that is alive, that is full of life and breath and health, and healthy things grow. The fruit of the Spirit is the difference that God's presence makes in your life and my life, in our corporate life. And it's not something we turn on, turn off, choose to do, make a decision, because if it is, then that's just our own human effort. The fruit of the Spirit is not the result of hard work or behavior modification. Well, just try harder or do more. The fruit of the Spirit is not the result of hard work or behavior modification. As followers of Jesus Christ, when we put our trust in Christ, the seed of God's Holy Spirit is planted within us. That seed which has everything in it to help us become who God has called us to be, that fruit of the Spirit is a natural byproduct of our relationship with Christ, and it is produced inside of us. Once upon a time, there was a little boy who was born blind, and he suffered the abuses of vulnerability as he was growing up in the world without his sight. And when he became a man, he looked back and reflected on his life and realized that he'd had no childhood at all. And there in his 40s, he realized that if he was ever going to have a childhood, he'd have to start having it right here, right now. So the first thing he did was rechristen himself, Joy Bubbles. That was his name. The second thing he did was declare himself five years old forever. And the third thing he did was make a pilgrimage to the University of Pittsburgh's Information Science Library, who holds a Mr. Rogers archive complete with special episodes in all 865, both black and white and color. And for two months, 10 hours a day, he watched or listened to every episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And Joy Bubbles said he imagined how they were playing out in his life. One night, Joy Bubbles had a dream where Mr. Rogers came to him and offered to teach him how to pray. And Joy Bubbles said, Mr. Rogers, I can't pray. Every time I try to pray, I forget the words. And Mr. Rogers said, I know. That's why the prayer I'm going to teach you has only three words. Joy Bubbles like, what prayer is that, Mr. Rogers? What prayer has only three words? Mr. Rogers says, thank you, God. Thank you, God. One of the sweetest fruits of Mr. Rogers' life was the ability to be fully present with whomever was right in front of him, whether a crowded Penn Station or seemingly a dream of a young man rechristened joy bubbles. Fred Rogers was full of the presence of Christ, and that allowed him to be fully present to the lives of others. And he chose a continual, faithful lifestyle that positioned himself weekly as he gathered with the body, daily positioned himself for a life filled with joy, with purpose, filled with the person and power of Jesus Christ. Fred Rogers woke up at 5.30 in the morning every single day, prayed for people by name, spent time in quiet solitude reflecting over the scriptures, made connections everywhere he went. He wrote notes of encouragement and made calls to let people know that he cared. And the next morning, he got up at 5.30 and did it all over again. 
positioning himself to the person and work of Jesus that produced great fruit in his life, shaped the congregation that he led, fruit. This idea that Paul's talking about in Galatians 5, the word fruit is singular. And all the words that describe it aren't things that we need to pluck, pull, taste, and see. They are descriptors of the fruit of the presence of Christ inside of the lives of his people, individually and corporately. My question is, is it in you? The presence of Jesus is the fruit being produced. We can position ourselves individually, only God makes the fruit grow. We can position ourselves corporately only God makes the fruit grow. And all of these things that Paul describes about, he's really describing what we began with this morning, what he began with in Galatians 5 verse 1. We're talking freedom. That's what life in Christ looks like. That's what's available to you and me, this freedom that is found only in Jesus Christ. And I wonder how many of us look for this freedom in other things that rob us of joy and force us to try harder, do better, be nicer. Very simply, if we would just surrender and commit and position ourselves, we might experience the sap of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. So I want to encourage you to position yourself. Individually, yes, but don't elevate that over and against what God is doing in the corporate gathering. This is vital, maybe the most important spiritual discipline that we give ourselves to as a people of God. And so we can respond in that way. We can position ourselves. That's the encouragement. But the challenge is, if you need peace in your life, if you need patience, joy, goodness, self-control, all of these things, just stop. Because we can't win that battle. We can't produce those things. And if we can, it's our own doing and it's a false sense of security, a false finish line that we're running to. So, we experience the fruit. We taste and have seen the Lord is good, but then sometimes life's onslaught just feels like we've taken steps backwards by yards. Even in the bad, let's bless the Lord. Let's pray the prayer that Mr. Rogers taught us. Thank you, God, in all things. But if you're going through a muck and mire of a mess in your life. The invitation is to give that to the Lord. I've tried. I'm at the end, Lord. I give this to you. I surrender. I'm finished. Take over. I want to lead us in prayer before we close. Heavenly Father, you are better to us than we deserve, having saved us. But we know that's not the end. We know that you long to save us to the uttermost. We know that salvation is not one moment in time. It's moments all the time, moments that produce life in the Spirit, that produce fruit of the Spirit characterized by all the things. And so we search ourselves and we open ourselves up to you. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. As you shine a light inside of this place, inside of our hearts, God, would you expose human effort? 
Lord, we know there are some in the room who are struggling, searching, longing for answers. Whatever your situation, whatever your circumstance, I want to invite you to give that to God this morning. Lay it down at the altar. Don't pick it back up. Lord, as we as we enter into a time of worship I pray that's a plural I Lord we pray that you would help yourself to us that we might be fruitful and exhibit your presence in our lives we're desperate, we're hungry, we long for more of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.